Um, well, uh, well, thank you very much, Rachel. I, I apologize for the short delay in, um, in getting this talk started. Um, there are a couple of slides that, um, that would have had videos, but unfortunately they, they won't have videos today, but I'll try to sort of act out what the videos would look like uh, to, to the best of my, my ability. Um, this is a, an image called the, the Hubble Deep Field. Uh, this is um, probably one of the most famous uh, images in, in astrophysics. It's a, an image that, that probably many of you have seen before. Uh, this is a, an image that was made uh, by taking the Hubble Space Telescope and pointing it at, at a little tiny patch of, of the sky that looked otherwise completely dark, just about, about two and a half arc minutes across. And that's about the same size as the head of a pin would be held at arm's length. So the Hubble Telescope stared at this little tiny patch of the sky for hundreds and hundreds of hours. And this is the image that, that eventually came uh, into focus through the telescope. And each one of the, the little points of light that you see here on this on this image are not stars, but they're actually galaxies, each one of these with, with hundreds of billions of stars. So if you count up all the galaxies in this image, there's something like 10,000 or 15,000 galaxies here. And if you extrapolate across the whole sky, that means that just in the part of the universe that we can see, there's hundreds of billions of galaxies, again, each one of them with, with hundreds of billions of stars. Uh, so the, the point here is that the universe is an incredibly big place. There's an awful lot of, of stuff out there. Uh, just in the, in the part of the universe that, that we can see. And I think when we think about that, that vastness of space, how big the universe is, I think the first question that comes to, to many of our minds is, is well, could, could there be other planets out there? Could, could those hundreds of billions of stars and hundreds of billions of galaxies, could they themselves have, have planetary systems going around their stars like we do here in our own solar system? Uh, and, and the answer to that is, is unequivocally yes, and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, what we've learned about, about extrasolar planets. Uh, but I think once, once we start to think about, about planets and, and planets around all these other stars that exist, we start to think about life. Uh, could there be on, on these planets around other stars uh, in our own galaxy and other galaxies, could there, could there be life uh, like, like a rose on our, own, on our own planet? And I think if we continue down that, that train of thought, we start to think about, about intelligent life. Is it, is it possible that, that somewhere amongst these these hundreds of billions of, of, of planets around hundreds of billions of stars in this, in this vastness of space, uh, could, could intelligent life have, have arisen? Uh, perhaps something like, like the life that we have uh, on our own planet. And perhaps could that life have evolved a, a technological capacity far exceeding our own? The universe is, is very old. It's almost 14 billion years old. So there's a lot of time for, for very advanced civilizations to have, have grown far beyond our own, our own technical prowess here, here on Earth. So this is a, an incredibly uh, profound question, and I think it's uh, been recognized by, by many people, uh, not just in the, in the scientific community, but, uh, but also just in the public. It's, it's really uh, incredibly profound to imagine that, that around some of these other planets that are being discovered, that, that there could, could be other life uh, and perhaps, perhaps intelligent life. Uh, and that's exactly what, what we try to answer uh, in SETI. That's, that's the question that we're trying to, to determine, is whether or not we're alone as, as intelligent beings in the universe. So we call um, this field the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, but really it's a search for extraterrestrial technology. We don't have any way of directly detecting intelligence. It would be very difficult for us to determine if there were uh, some kind of uh, intelligent uh, fish-like creature swimming around in the oceans of Europa uh, or, or something of that nature. So we have to use uh, some kind of a, a proxy for, for intelligence, and we use uh, technology. Uh, certainly, the, the technology that we, that we have on our own planet is capable of, of producing electromagnetic emission that's, that's powerful enough that we could detect it at very, very large distances, interstellar distances. Uh, and those can be the, the sorts of things that maybe you imagine when you think about SETI, like, like radio signals, but also very powerful laser signals that we produce for, for things like adaptive optics and astronomy. These types of signals would be detectable at, at very, very long distances with the, with the right kind of equipment. So we, we concentrate our, our SETI searches in, in what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and this is a, a plot of the, the electromagnetic spectrum. Here you see some kind of electromagnetic radiation that you're probably familiar with, optical light. Uh, but of course, there's all kinds of different uh, electromagnetic radiation, everything from, from radio waves down here at very long wavelengths to, to high energy x-rays and gamma rays here at the, at the shortest wavelengths or the highest energy. And this shows a, a plot of all of the different types of electromagnetic radiation that reaches the Earth. 
so that the ionosphere and the atmosphere of the Earth blocks certain wavelengths of light uh, from getting down, down to the Earth. Uh, but there are windows that do get to us all the way from space. So, of course, in the radio portion, we can, we can receive electromagnetic radiation from, from space. And, and also, when we look at stars, we're, we're looking at an optical light that comes through the atmosphere that reaches all the way uh, to, the, to the surface of the Earth. And we try to conduct uh, searches for extraterrestrial intelligence, so searches for evidence of technology everywhere that we possibly can where this electromagnetic radiation uh, falls on the, on the surface of the Earth. And in the, in the radio portion of the, of the spectrum, uh, we call that, call that radio SETI. That's maybe the, the SETI that you're familiar with if you've read a little bit about this. Uh, but we also have optical and infrared SETI that I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, where we search in the, in the optical or the infrared uh, portion of the spectrum. And again, th this is uh, basically, we, we don't have any idea where uh, we're going to sense a, a signal from, a, from an advanced civilization. Uh, so we want to search as much of the electromagnetic spectrum as we possibly can. Uh, so we have a, a couple of examples of, of uh, radio sources that we have here on Earth that are very detectable at, at very, very large distances. Uh, so two of those are uh, the, the Arecibo planetary radar down here in the, in the bottom right, and, and something called the Space Fence radar up here in the top left. So the, the Arecibo telescope, it, maybe you've heard of this, this before, usually this telescope is used to receive uh, radio signals. It's used as a, as a radio telescope. Uh, but it actually has a, an, an active transmitter on it that's used for radar imaging of asteroids and other bodies in our own solar system. And when that radar is active, this is the most luminous radio transmitter that we have on, on the planet Earth. And this transmitter could be detectable across the galaxy with the experiments that we do now. Uh, and also this, this space fence radar, this is not, not quite as bright, not quite as, as luminous, not, not quite as visible uh, as, as the Arecibo radar but it produces a very, very large beam on the sky. So this thing, again, is very bright, but it only illuminates a really small portion of the sky. So the, the odds that we would be within the beam of a, an extraterrestrial Arecibo is fairly small. Uh, but some of the very bright uh, radio signals that we produce have very large beams on the sky and would be much more readily detectable. Um, as I mentioned already, uh, we also have, have optical sources, laser sources on, on, the, on the surface of the Earth. Uh, that would be detectable at, at interstellar distances. Uh, and one kind of fun example of that is if you take the most powerful laser that we have, this is a, a pulse laser that's just down the road at, at Livermore National Lab. It's used for, for fusion experiments. You take this very powerful laser and you paired it with some of our largest optical telescopes, like the 10-meter Keck telescopes in Hawaii. Uh, this system combined could outshine the sun at 1,000 light years uh, for the brief fraction of a second that that laser pulses. Which is really quite, quite amazing. The sun is, of course, incredibly bright. Uh, it's it's uh, very, very luminous and very difficult to outshine. But even with our own technology, uh, if, if we s sort of paired these in, in, the right, uh, in the right apparatus, we could outshine our own sun uh, by, by many orders of magnitude. So the very first uh, radio SETI experiment was conducted by a gentleman named Frank Drake. Maybe this is a, a name that you've heard of. Uh, with a, a fairly small telescope, about an 85-foot telescope in a, in a little town in, in West Virginia called, called Greenbank. And this was called, called Project Ozma. And this was really the, the beginning of, of Radio SETI. This is the first what we call modern Radio SETI experiment, uh, where SETI was conducted in a, in a way that's very similar to the way that we conduct SETI now. Now, Frank had a uh, very limited technology available to him. He had a, a radio that really wasn't all that different from, from your car stereo that he could tune around. Uh, and he observed just a, a couple of stars at just a couple of frequencies uh, near about 1,420 megahertz. And, of course, he didn't, he didn't detect anything. But this laid the, the groundwork for all of the, the SETI that I think came, came in the future. Uh, and just a couple of years after Frank uh, conducted that experiment, uh, there was a conference that was held where, where Frank presented uh, the, the equation that now is sort of synonymous with, with his name, the, the so-called Drake equation. Um, uh, and maybe many of you have seen this equation before. Here, here N is the, the number of civilizations that we might be able to detect, uh, the number of, of communicative civilizations. And then here on the right-hand side of the equation are all of the factors that go into the emergence of, of technological life or communicative life. Uh, R, the, the rate of star formation in the galaxy, and P, the fraction of those stars that have planets. And it goes all the way on through here to the fraction of, uh, of, of, of 
planets that might develop life, fractures of that life that might develop intelligence, and, and so on. And this was, uh, I think it's important to point out, this was never sort of meant to be a, sort of a, uh, an equation like, um, like F equals MA or E equals MC squared. This isn't a sort of an analytical solution that allows us to, to directly predict uh, how much life we might be able to come into uh, contact with. But more, it's a, it's a thought experiment. It's just a way of thinking about the different factors uh, that might go into the emergence uh, of intelligent life. So a couple of these. Um, we have a, actually a, a pretty good idea of that. Uh, so just from our studies in, in astrophysics, we know approximately what the rate of star formation is and, and the number of, of stars that have planets. And if you, if you calculate all of these together, you end up with billions of opportunities for life. Something like one in five of the stars that you see in the night sky when you look out in our own galaxy probably have planets that are something like the Earth, between one and two Earth radii, uh, and within the so-called habitable zone of their star. They're, they're close enough to their star where liquid water could exist on the surface, but not too close uh, for that water to evaporate away, or too far away uh, for that water to freeze. So these other terms uh, in, in this equation uh, are, are much more difficult uh, at the current time to determine. We really don't, don't have any way of, of, of testing these uh, yet. But I think we have reasons to be, to be optimistic about them. And, um, and in the end, I think, you know, this is a, really a very important point for SETI, and I think Carl Sagan uh, summed it up very well in a, in a sort of a, uh, an editorial piece that he had in Science Magazine about 30 years ago, uh, and that is that the only significant test of the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence is an experimental one. The only way that we're ever going to be able to, to test some of the parameters in this Drake equation, the fraction of life that go on to develop intelligence, is to actually conduct experiments to try to detect that intelligence. And that's, that's exactly what, what SETI is. It, it's an experimental science that's trying to determine whether or not uh, other life exists and whether that life uh, evolves intelligence. So again, uh, we, we have a lot of reasons to be very optimistic about, uh, about this search that we're doing. And, and I already mentioned this, but uh, really, you know, we hear a lot about, uh, about planet discoveries in the media. It seems like every week we're hearing about new planets that are discovered by the Kepler mission or by other missions. Uh, but the, the bottom line, the punchline of all of this is, is that most stars have planets. In fact, probably all stars uh, to, to zeroth order uh, have planets. And something like one in five, one in five, 20 percent of all of the stars that are in our galaxy have a planet that's something like the, the Earth. So it's really a, an incredible opportunity uh, for life to develop. And, and of course, that implies that there's something like tens to, to 100 billion Earth-like planets just in our own galaxy. Of course, many of, of these planets have been discovered by the Kepler mission. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with how this works. Uh, the, the Kepler mission stares at about 100,000 stars, or at least in the first iteration of, of the Kepler mission, it stared at about 100,000 stars. And watch for the little dip in light uh, as a planet uh, passed in front of the, the star. And it was an incredibly successful experiment and really is, is responsible for us knowing this fact that, that something like 20% of, of stars have a planet like the Earth. And the Kepler mission has found all kinds of different planets, uh, really a, a, a zoo of planets. And this is a kind of a fun way of characterizing those in something called the, the periodic table of exoplanets. Some of them are cold, and some of them are warm, some very hot, some very large, some very small. Uh, really a, an incredible zoo uh, of, of different types of planetary systems. Uh, but importantly, something like one in five stars has a planet like the Earth. Again, between one and two radii of, of the Earth, and, and in that, that habitable zone of their star, uh, where, uh, where liquid water could exist on the surface. Uh, we have other reasons to be optimistic about SETI. Uh, and I, just a, a couple of those I can go through. One of them is, is that, uh, you know, we, in order for life to evolve, you might imagine that we need some complex chemistry. We need some building blocks for basic life. And we find lots and lots of building blocks literally everywhere we look in astronomy. Uh, we found what we call prebiotic molecules, uh, uh, multi, multi carbon organic compounds in, in protoplanetary disks all over the galaxy. These are the, the, the birthplace of, of planetary systems. And they seem to be chock full of all of the stuff that we think is necessary for life to emerge. 
When we look inside meteorites uh, on our own planet that we find that, that fall to us from, from within our own solar system, we can look inside of those meteorites and we find, again, all kinds of complex organic compounds. All of the stuff that we think was necessary for life to emerge on Earth seems to exist uh, ubiquitously in, in our own galaxy. It seems to be all over the place. Uh, and we can do sort of basic experiments to see if, if maybe we can make even more complicated molecules by um, replicating the conditions that existed on, on earlier. And, uh, and really a famous set of experiments along these lines is something called Miller-Urey experiments. And the way that these work is, is that you construct a sort of a glass apparatus that looks something like this. You put some seawater in here, some uh, just sort of a basic kind of soup of stuff that we think existed on, on the, the primordial Earth early in the Earth's uh, formation. And then you heat it up, kind of mimicking a, a volcanic vent uh, that, that might heat up that, that seawater. And then you pass it through a, this is a spark discharge gap, so it electrifies, it sparks uh, the, the, um, the mist, it sort of comes out of this, this evaporating stuff here. You shock it, and then you allow it to condense, and you see what comes out. And what we've seen is, is that is that even more complicated organic compounds can be synthesized in this way uh, with a, a purely biochemical origin. So you can you can take the, the sort of basic prebiotic molecules that we know that exist all over the place, and with some, some natural processes, you can make even more complicated compounds and and move towards uh, towards complicated, uh, perhaps uh, single single cell life. And, and we've also learned that uh, life can exist in extraordinarily extreme environments on the Earth. So it used to be that, that we imagined that, that most life required kind of basically the same sorts of stuff that, that the, the ecosystem on the surface of the Earth requires. It needs sunlight, uh, it needs photosynthesis, these kinds of things. But there's actually a whole ecosystem that exists at the, at the very bottom of the ocean, several miles below the surface of the ocean, around hydrothermal vents. Uh, where entire ecosystems of, of organisms survive off uh, chemosynthetic bacteria, bacteria that, that live off of chemical reactions involving the, uh, the, the hydrothermal vents at the, at the bottom of the ocean. And this is an example of these, these chemosynthetic bacteria. So it, it seems that, uh, that there's lots of, of, of stuff that's necessary for life. All of the basic building blocks for life are out there. Uh, and life, life can exist in, in very, very extreme environments. So it doesn't look like uh, life is especially finely tuned to need a, a very particular set of, of conditions that, that might exist on the surface of the Earth. It seems to be able to exist uh, just about everywhere that, that it possibly could. But I think the, the real question um, that sort of comes out of this is, you know, you might uh, sort of accept that, that these prebiotic molecules exist and that uh, we can take sort of basic prebiotic molecules and we can make more complicated things. Uh, but but the, the real question, I think one of the most difficult questions I'm studying is, well, is it common for intelligence to, to evolve? Uh, in some res respects, we only have one example of an intelligent species that, that arose uh, on the surface of the, the Earth uh, in, that sort of has the, the technological capacity of, of human beings. So is that a fluke? Is that just some sort of random uh, evolutionary happenstance that we that we happen to evolve the, the capacity to, to create technology, or is uh, is evolution somehow sort of sort of driven towards this? And and does do, do many species uh, develop a, a technological capacity? And again, that that's exactly the, the question that we're trying to answer um, in SETI. So we talked already about the, the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, this is a, another sort of example of that, that plot that I already showed you. Um, and so in order to search across the electromagnetic spectrum, in order to, to search for optical signals and infrared signals and, and all different, different variety of, of radio signals, we need to use many different telescopes. And I'm going to show you a few of the experiments that we're doing to try to, to, try to detect these signals. Um, all the way from the, the very, very lowest radio frequencies, the longest wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation, all the way up through to, to optical light. Um, so, uh, so where would you point a, a telescope in a, in a SETI experiment? I think this is a, a really sort of uh, interesting question, and it's a question that, that even scientists have disagreement about. Uh, many people have different ideas uh, about where we should point the telescope. Um, of course, stars like the sun or, or exoplanet systems like, uh, that, that look like our own solar system are, are very prime targets. Um, maybe very nearby stars. Uh, so of course, our, our experiments are limited in their, in their sensitivity. Uh, 
a transmitter that we detect has to be uh, has to have a certain luminosity or has to have a certain brightness for us to be able to detect it. So maybe we should look at look at nearby stars and also, of course, just known exoplanets. We're discovering all of these extrasolar planets. Perhaps we should spend a lot of time uh, on on those. And we we target all of these different things in our in our SETI experiments and try not to make too many assumptions about uh, what the best possible target would be uh, in, a, in a SETI experiment. Um, so I, I think one of the coolest things that's come out of the, the, the Kepler mission um, is not the discovery of individual extrasolar planets, but actually the discovery of multiple uh, extrasolar planet systems. So uh, this is one of those animations that, that I told you that uh, unfortunately you don't get to see. Um, but if this, if this were a video, you would see all of these multiple planet systems spinning around, uh, and this is a, a plot of all of the, the multiple planet systems that, that the Kepler mission um, has discovered. And so this, this discovery, our knowledge of these multiple planet systems, and our very accurate information about exactly when these planets orbit their star. So remember, Kepler found these planets by watching the star and watching for that dip in light uh, when the planet passes in front of the star. So not only do we know that, that all of these systems exist, and, and we know a little bit about the planets, but we actually know exactly when they pass in front of their star as seen from Earth. And this allows us to do something really cool in SETI, uh, something that we call exoplanet eavesdropping. So many of you probably know that, that traveling near the speed of light takes a lot of energy. It's very, very difficult. And many people believe that it's so difficult that it's probably exceedingly rare for even a technologically capable species to, to travel between between stars. So if a, if a very advanced civilization started to, to run out of room or resources on the planet where they first arose, maybe the first thing that they would do is they would colonize another planet in their own solar system. So if they did that, uh, perhaps there would be some communication between those two planets. So using this, this very accurate knowledge of, of the orbits of these multiple planet systems discovered by Kepler, we can actually time our observations of these systems using our SETI experiments on Earth to the moment when two of these planets are aligned relative to the Earth. So if the civilizations on these two planets are communicating with one another, we have a chance to eavesdrop on that, that communication. And this is a, a very exciting new technique uh, that we're just starting to, to use in, in some of our experiments. So this is a, a telescope that uh, we, just, we just started using. I'm sort of going to start with the, kind of the most recent uh, uh, experiments that we've been conducting um, in, uh, um, in, in SETI. And I think, so Rachel mentioned that I have a, a joint affiliation with uh, an institute in the Netherlands, a couple of institutes in the Netherlands. And the reason why that, that exists is, is that we're trying to take advantage of this new European telescope called the Low Frequency Array. And the, the really special thing about this telescope is, is that it's sensitive to very, very long wavelengths, uh, uh, very, very low frequencies of radiation, much lower than we've ever been able to search for in the past. Uh, and actually, it's, it's sensitive to the same radio frequencies that we use for our uh, radio and, and television here on the surface of the Earth. So you might think that, um, that maybe this would be a very obvious place to conduct a SETI experiment, but historically, not very many SETI experiments have been done uh, at these frequencies. And so we're very excited to be conducting a search of the, the nearest stars to the Earth, the, the 30 or so stars that are within about, uh, about 15 light years uh, of the Earth in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and we just completed these observations uh, at the end of 2014. And the, the analysis of, of these data are underway. And we're, we're very excited about this experiment and also other experiments that we're going to be able to do to look at these, these very long wavelengths, these low frequencies uh, of, of radiation. Um, there's, a, there's a brand new telescope in that little town in West Virginia where I, I told you that Frank Drake conducted the very first SETI experiment uh, called the, the Green Bank Telescope. This is the, the largest fully steerable radio telescope in the world. Uh, and by fully steerable, I mean that this whole structure can move and can point sort of just about anywhere that's above the horizon uh, from this facility. Uh, and it has a, a very, very broad uh, frequency coverage, so it can look at a, a lot of different, different radio frequencies. Um, and beginning about five years ago, we've been using this experiment for SETI. Uh, and the very first experiment we did with it was to look at some of those Kepler planets uh, that had been discovered by the, by the Kepler mission. Uh, and we, we published a paper about a year and a half ago on some of our, our first results uh, with this telescope. And we came up with sort of two uh, kind of important punchlines, I think, from that work. And 
something like less than one in 10,000 stars hosts a, a civilization that has a, a radial luminosity that's somewhat comparable to what we can produce on Earth. So less than one in 10,000 stars has a radio transmitter as bright as, as our brightest uh, radio transmitter on Earth, that, that Arecibo uh, uh, radio telescope that I, that I talked about earlier. Um, and something like less than one in a million stars hosts a civilization that ha has a very, very bright radio transmitter. So if we imagine that some very advanced civilization could produce a, a very, very bright radio signal, uh, less than one in a million stars uh, hosts a civilization like that. Sure. Yeah, so that, that comes from taking the, the sensitivity of our experiment and assessing the, the number of stars that we were able to observe. Uh, and, and then you can, you can come up with a, a limit, uh, sort of a, a, a lower limit. Uh, another telescope uh, that, that we use quite a lot um, is, is this Arecibo telescope. And remember, again, I, I told you that this telescope is usually used just to, to receive radio signals, and, and we use it in, in SETI uh, for, for, that, for that purpose. Uh, and we have a, a whole bunch of different experiments here at, at this telescope. The really cool thing about how we use the Arecibo telescope is, is in something called a, a piggyback or a, or a commensal observing mode. So what that means is, is that we've come up with a way of using the Arecibo radio telescope to do SETI when any other kind of radio astronomy is, is going on with the telescope. So rather than having to take control of the telescope and point it at certain places and, and use up observing time, we actually have a way of just listening in on the data that comes from the telescope uh, while other people are using it and then doing a, a parallel analysis uh, for SETI. And, and so the, that's a fantastic kind of experiment to do because the Arecibo telescope is huge. It's 300 meters across. It's very, very sensitive. But if you're using the telescope basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it generates a huge amount of data. Uh, and figuring out how to analyze that, that data was a, was a real challenge. And so what uh, the group came up with was something called, called SETI at Home. This is a, a screensaver, a program that you can download on your own computer. And when you start up the program, it takes a, a little bit of data from our computers in Berkeley and processes it on your computer and then sends the results back to us. And um, here you can, you can see sort of the, the schematic of how that works. You have uh, work units, you have little bits of data being sent out to volunteers that, that run the program. You have uh, work units being sent back, so results of the processing being sent back to Berkeley. And a, a number of different, different data sources. So, uh, historically, all of the data for this study at home program is coming from Arecibo. Uh, but we're very excited to be adding the capability to this software so that it can process data from other telescopes, uh, including the, the low frequency array that I talked to you about and also the, also the Green Bank telescope. So, if you, if you run, how many people here run SETI at home or have heard of SETI at home? So if you, if, you, if you still run SETI at home, uh, or, or if you're excited to give it a try, uh, stay tuned, because very soon, uh, in addition to being able to, to select how much of your computer power goes to this program and when it runs, you're also going to be able to select where the data comes from that you process uh, on your computer. Uh, and here's a picture of the, the screensaver. Again, this would have been animated, and it's much more beautiful than, than this image would be. Uh, uh, this image shows, uh, but it's really a, a fun thing to try on your computer. It shows you exactly uh, where the, the, the telescope was pointed when you were processing, uh, what, what frequency uh, you were looking at, uh, and, and also kind of what types of signals uh, the SETI at Home screensaver is, is looking for. So the, really the, the advantage of, of SETI at Home is, is that it allows us to search for a huge, wide variety of signals. So when we uh, conduct a SETI experiment at an observatory where we, we use the computers that we're able to bring to the telescope or the computers that are available at the observatory, we're limited in, in the number of different types of signals that we can look for. So uh, some of you might say, well, you know, what, what kind of radio signals do you look for? And, and usually it's narrowband signals. And, and often if there's electrical engineers in the room, they say, well, what about wideband signals? You know, what about signals that are more similar to our modern uh, kinds of radio communication? Uh, because SETI at Home has so much computing power available, it can search for, for those wideband signals and a, a whole variety of, of other types of signals as well. Uh, so SETI at Home uh, was incredibly um, powerful, I think, I think for SETI, 
uh, but it was also really a, a kind of laid the groundwork for a whole generation of what we call distributed computing projects. So the type of, of technology that we use uh, in SETI at home to process uh, radio telescope data to look for signals for extraterrestrial intelligence are now used by a, a whole slew of other researchers that have very computationally intensive problems uh, that, that they can't get supercomputer time to solve. Uh, and just a, a couple of those are um, protein folding um, programs and also climate prediction and there's hundreds of different types of science that you can do with this same infrastructure uh, that was built up for, for looking for, for extraterrestrial intelligence. And uh, a, a second extension of that uh, that many of you are probably familiar with is the idea of, well, why not, instead of just using your, your computing power that you have uh, at home, why not also use your eyes and your ears and your brains uh, to, to contribute to, to scientific, uh, scientific challenges? And so that gave rise to something we call, we call BASA. This is a, an open infrastructure for, for distributed thinking. Uh, so a way of actually allowing you to, to not just run your computer to process some data, but actually look at the data that you're, uh, that you're analyzing and, and make, uh, make judgments and use your, your sort of human, human capacity that, uh, that computers uh, can't, yet, uh, can't yet capture. And the, the first experiment that we did uh, along these lines was with a spacecraft called Stardust. Uh, this was a, an experiment that sent a, a satellite out beyond the orbit of Mars to capture dust grains, interstellar uh, dust grains that are floating around in our, in our solar system to try to learn about what the solar system was like when it first formed. Um, and the way that this experiment worked is, is that there was a, a big panel that unfolded from the spacecraft with a, a special substance uh, in the panel called aerogel that could capture these dust grains when they slammed into the spacecraft. So it's just like a sort of a strainer that the, the spacecraft held out and swept along as it, as it floated out past the, the orbit of Mars to capture these dust grains. Um, and, it, and, and then this, uh, this panel was returned to Earth. And the, the challenge of this experiment was to search through all of these, these little chunks of, of aerogel, all of these substances, to try to find these, these individual particles uh, that were collected by the spacecraft. And in order to do that, it would take, uh, it was calculated thousands of years of analysis for an individual researcher to, to take very, very careful images of all these little chunks of this aerogel to look for these, these particle tracks. And this is something that, that computers aren't very good at, but the human eye and the human mind is very, very good at. And so using this, um, this infrastructure that we talked about, uh, we put together a, a, a special kind of website that you could go to um, where you could kind of have a, a virtual microscope that allowed uh, anyone in the, in the public uh, to, to actually look at the same images that a scientist would look at and could, could be trained to actually find these, these little dust grains. Uh, and there were something like 50 to 100,000 people that participated in this experiment. Uh, about 50 of these particle tracks were discovered and the, the very first interstellar dust grains that were discovered by this, by this mission were actually found by a, uh, by a public volunteer. Uh, and so I think this is a, an amazing example of, of really what the, what the internet and, a, and an interested public uh, can accomplish in, in science. And, and we're very excited about this idea uh, for SETI as well, and we've been thinking about ways to not only take advantage of, of people's computing power again, but, but also their minds to try to perhaps be sensitive to signals that, that we haven't thought of before. Uh, and there's a, a number of other uh, projects that have come out of this, including uh, mapping craters on the moon and looking for fossils in the... Uh, the, the African desert, uh, and a variety of other things. And if, if you're interested uh, in, in these kinds of projects, I, I really encourage you to, to check out our, our website, uh, the URL I'll, I'll give you in a, in a second. Uh, and a, another uh, project that is very similar is, is the, the Galaxy Zoo. So this is a, a project to, to uh, categorize the, the morphology of galaxy shapes. This is not a, a project that, that's done by our group, but sort of very similar in spirit uh, to what I've talked to you about already. And I think um, many of you probably are, if you're coming to this lecture, you probably know about, about a lot of these projects. Uh, I think we're really in a, a, a golden age of, of citizen science. It's really a, an incredible time, uh, not only to, to be a scientist, but just simply to be interested in science, because there are so many opportunities for you to engage in an incredibly meaningful way um, in the, the, the research that I've talked about uh, today, but also a huge variety of, of research in, in fields uh, well outside of astronomy. 
So uh, the experiments that I've talked with you about so far uh, are our, uh, our radio uh, experiments. Um, but as I said, we also conduct experiments uh, in, the, in the optical portion of the spectrum. Um, and the, there's a number of advantages to, to optical signals, but I think really the one that I find most compel compelling is, is that the, the information capacity of a signal is, is proportional to bandwidth. So if, a, if an advanced intelligence, suppose they wanted to intentionally signal us, uh, a radio signal might make a lot of sense. It's, it's very easy to pick up against the, the sort of background static of the, of the universe. Uh, but in many ways, it's, it's really just a, a kind of a binary signal. It's sort of on or off. Uh, it's one, one bit. There's not a, a lot of information there. But if a, if a very advanced civilization wanted to transmit a, a huge amount of data to us, if they wanted to send us a, the so-called Encyclopedia Galactica, um, some trove of, of all of the knowledge that they contain, they, they might pick uh, something like a, an optical signal to do that. Uh, and we have a, a couple of, of new experiments, one that's, that's absolutely brand new, that's just going to go on the telescope in about a, about a month, uh, to search for, for optical signals at, at Lick Observatory. Um, and, and that's, of course, just a, a couple of hours south of here. This is a, a project that's led by a, a professor at, at the University of California, San Diego, named, named Shelley Wright. Um, and the, the new experiment that we're doing at Lick is, is going to allow us to look into what's called the near-infrared uh, portion of the electromagnetic spectrum for the very first time. Uh, so the, the near-infrared are, are wavelengths that are just a little bit longer than, than optical light. Um, and so you might, uh, sort of on the surface, not, not think that that really means a whole lot. But it turns out that, that near-infrared light is very, very exciting for astronomy and very, very exciting for SETI. And the reason is, is that that near-infrared light can get through the dust between the stars much more readily than, than the optical light. So this is a, an optical image of the Milky Way. This is the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. And you see all these little kind of dark splotches in here. Those are, are dust lanes. They're, they're clouds of dust and, and, and uh, extended clouds of dust that are blocking uh, optical light from reaching us from, from those portions of the galaxy. And here's a, a very similar image, but just a, a little bit longer wavelengths in the near infrared. And you see all of those dark splotches are gone. And that's because that, that near infrared light can get through the dust uh, between the stars much more readily. Uh, so in a, in a SETI experiment, that allows us to see much more deeply into the galaxy. It allows us to probe many, many more stars and gives us a, a much better chance of, of detecting a, uh, an extraterrestrial laser were it to exist. Yeah? similar images in the sort of the projection that they're showing. Um, another telescope that we're, that we're very excited about using is um, it's called the FAST telescope. Uh, this is a, a telescope that's being constructed in, in China. It's sort of a, a Chinese version of the, the Arecibo telescope. So I mentioned that, that the Arecibo telescope is, um, is 300 meters across. The FAST telescope will be 500 meters across. So significantly more sensitive, something like a factor of four more sensitive uh, than, than Arecibo. And um, the, the, the Chinese group of astronomers that's, that's in charge of the, the science for this telescope are very excited about, about doing SETI with it, and we've been working with them uh, very, very closely. And uh, this not only will allow us to, to have a, a whole other source of, source of data, a whole other telescope to to look, uh, to look at for, for SETI, but also this telescope, because of the way that it's built and where it is, uh, it will have access to a, a, a different and, and, in some cases, larger portion of the sky than we have access to um, with, uh, with Arecibo. So maybe some of you have, have heard about uh, this brand new radio telescope that's being built called the Square Kilometer Array. This is a, an effort to build a, a radio telescope that has something like 10 times the collecting area of even fast, even our, our very largest radio telescopes. This will be something like 10 times more, more sensitive. 
And this telescope is going to be built uh, in, uh, in South Africa and in Australia. It's actually made up of a, a number of different separate telescopes, each of which is, is made up of a, of a whole bunch of dishes. Um, and uh, the, the, really the punchline, I think, for the, the square kilometer array is that this telescope will, for the first time, allow us to be sensitive to, to radio signals that are about the same sort of energy level as, as the leakage radiation that leaks off of the Earth. So uh, the, the sort of radio signals and TV signals that, that we produce on Earth are really um, undetectable to our current generation of experiments, even from the very nearest stars. They're just too weak. But another factor of 10 in, in collecting area, a factor of 10 in sensitivity, will allow us to be sensitive to those signals for the, for the very, very first time from about five of the, of the nearest stars, uh, which is a, really a dramatic step forward uh, for radio SETI and, and something that we're very, very excited about. Um, there's also a, a number of, of missions that uh, are, um, are kind of successors to Kepler and, and successors to, to Hipparchos and to, to other um, sort of uh, astronomy experiments that have, done in the, that have been done in the past that are going to dramatically increase the, the amount of, of, of targets that we have to look at um, in, in SETI experiments. So the Kepler mission, we, we talked a little bit about that before, that looked at a, about 100,000 stars, uh, but those 100,000 stars were themselves about a, a thousand parsecs or a few thousand light years away from the Earth. It was one little patch of stars that, that were quite distant. There's a, a similar uh, experiment that's going to be launched in a couple of years called TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, that's going to use the same technique as Kepler. Uh, it's going to look for that, that dipping of light from the star, uh, but it's going to look at stars that are very, very near to the Earth. So it's going to find similarly uh, many, many exoplanets, probably a uh, hundred or a few hundred uh, extrasolar planets from, from TESS, but it's going to find them very, very close to the Earth, and these are going to be real prime targets for our SETI experiments. There's also a, a satellite that's already up and is already starting to produce data called Gaia that's going to catalog something like a billion objects uh, within our galaxy and, and in some cases outside of our galaxy. And this is going to basically tell us every single star within a few hundred parsecs, uh, what, what type of star it is, of course, where it is, uh, the age of the star, uh, all of those kinds of things. So if we want to do a systematic search of the nearest stars to the Earth, the catalog produced by Gaia is going to be really fantastic. So um, in the, the last couple of minutes here, I wanted to, to return um, to the Drake equation just to point out something that I think is, is really incredibly profound uh, about this, this equation. And that is um, the, the last term in the equation, L, the, the average lifetime of a civilization. So on the surface, this doesn't really seem like something that, that you can probe uh, in, in such an experiment. But in fact, by measuring um, the... Uh, the the, the presence of, of extraterrestrial intelligence, we actually can, can infer uh, the lifetime of, of intelligent civilizations. And this is something that a, a, a very famous uh, engineer in here in SETI, Philip Morrison, called the, the archaeology of, of the future. So the idea here is that um, because uh, of the finite uh, speed of light, when we receive a signal from some distant star, we're seeing that, that civilization as it was maybe 500 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or maybe many thousands of years ago. Uh, but because the, the universe is so old, and, and our civilization is so young, it's likely that, that that civilization is far more advanced than we are in terms of their technological progress. So by looking at, at this other civilization's past, in many ways we're looking at, at our own future. Uh, and we're, we're learning whether or not it's possible for advanced civilizations to, to survive um, uh, hundreds of years or, or thousands of years, maybe hundreds of thousands of years after they've developed technology. Sure. I think um, maybe we can, uh, I just have a couple more slides, so maybe we can finish, then we can talk a little bit more about that um, at the end. Um, so uh, again, I, I think, you know, one of, really the promise of SETI is, is this ability to, to answer this question or at least give us some insight into what our civilization might be like 
uh, 100 years in the future? Is it, is it possible to survive uh, the, the sort of um, dramatic increase of technology that we're seeing now? Is it, is it really possible for, for humanity uh, to survive? And, you know, can we make it 10,000 years into the future? Is it possible for a technological species to make it 10,000 years into the future and to construct vast spaceships that might allow us to, to explore our, our own solar system and, and, and maybe beyond? Um, and uh, again, I think that the, this is, is really the, the, the most profound aspect of, of SETI is, is the opportunity to get some insight um, into this, this question. And, and with that, I'll take the rest of your questions. Thanks. So it, it absolutely is not a given that we are not alone. I, the truth is, is that we don't know. I mean, despite, you know, uh, hundreds of years, thousands of years of astronomy and, and, you know, 50 or 60 years of really kind of modern astronomy, we only know of one example of life anywhere in the universe, anywhere, even in our own solar system, and, and that's on the planet Earth. So um, for the moment, it's, it's an outstanding question, and I think sort of, uh, sort of posing the science as a question, are, are we alone, is probably the most the most accurate way way to pose it. Um, you know, I, I think uh, you know, and there's, there's sort of in the scientific community, I'd say there's sort of two um, two kind of camps. There's what I, I like to call the, the physicist camp, which is that if if something happens once, it probably didn't happen only once in the entire universe. It's probably happened a few times. And, um, and I, 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 my own sort of thoughts on the matter probably fall sort of in line with that, that idea. I, I think that it, it would be awfully strange if, um, if we were the, the only life anywhere in the, in the universe. Uh, but there's also the, the biologist camp. Um, and I think uh, many biologists look at the, at the question of, of the emergence of life uh, on Earth and, and say that, well, it's, it's quite possible that it only uh, emerged one time, that it really was some just complete random fluke of, of biochemistry that led to, to the first life uh, on this planet. I mean, there, there's lots and lots of planets, right? Lots and lots of water, lots and lots of prebiotic stuff. That's a very, very large number. Uh, but then there's some very small unknown probability of, of life arising. So take a very large number and multiply it by some unknown, really small number. You might get one. You might get ten. You know, you, you might get... A hundred billion. We just we just don't know. That's a hard question. So there's a, a number of, of sort of uh, 
sort of boutique ideas about, you know, the, the special conditions of our solar system that allowed life to emerge on Earth. So some people think it was the plate tectonics, some people think it was the presence of the moon and the tides that it rose on the ocean, and some people think it's, it's Jupiter. I mean, I think certainly, as you said, Jupiter played, played, played a role and continues to play a role. In, um, in protecting the Earth from, from large impacts or, or more large impacts from asteroids than it, than it experiences. I, we, don't, we don't know the answer to that. Um, so, you know, again, only one example of life. Uh, so, so it's completely unknown. But certainly I think if, you know, as we start to find more exoplanet systems, uh, were we to find an exoplanet system that, that had a configuration that was similar to the solar system in, in more ways, perhaps, that, that had a, a, a large planet, you know, outside the orbit of a, of a smaller planet that was in the habitable zone, we would, we would spend more time on those, those targets in our, in our SETI experiments. some biologists, as you said, think was very important. Uh, and again, um, as we learn more about exoplanet systems, uh, you know, the, the ones that we find that look the most like our own solar system uh, are going to be uh, at the highest of the list of the ones that, that we look for. Um, we just don't have that, that much information about exoplanet systems now to, to target systems like that. But, it, but if we did, I, certainly sort of similarity to our solar system, broadly speaking, is a uh, is a, a you know a, a very high ranking kind of factor in, in targeting. Oh well, 
so it's, it's used um, for, for two purposes. Uh, one, to image the surface of, of other bodies in our solar system, asteroids and you know, moons of other planets, things like that. Uh, and also to determine their, their ephemeris, so to, to determine their orbit. And the actual type of, of radio signal that it sends in those two cases is, is different. Um, but uh, the, the transmitter is like at about two and a half gigahertz or so. Um, it has a, you know, sometimes it has a very narrow bandwidth. Sometimes, oftentimes, it's used in a mode that's precisely similar to the type of signals that we look for in a SETI experiment. Other times, it's used in a broadband mode uh, that would be a little bit more difficult for us to detect with our current experiments. Oh yeah, it, well, it, it, it uses a, a pseudo-random code, uh, which just has to do with the way that it, it performs the imaging uh, when it does the, it shifts the phase in a particular way to allow it to construct uh, an image, um, but no, it doesn't send any, it doesn't encode any sort of information about humanity yet. yet. Um, yeah, I, well, on the first point, I, you know, I think um, we're an awfully long way from kind of theoretical limits. I mean, just to give you an example, it, you probably heard about um, uh, various experiments that have been designed that will have some sort of a, 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 a coronagraph, some occulting system to block out the sort of light from a star to allow it to, to see a very, very large contrast sort of between the star and the planet. And, um, experiments that are going to be designed to look at the atmospheres of extrasolar planets. There's a, an idea that's kind of on the books to actually use the sun as a gravitational lens. Uh, so if you stick a, a spacecraft out at 550 AU, way, way far away from, uh, from the sun, you can actually use the sun as a, as a lens itself as, the, as it, it curves space. So there's a, um, you know, there's, we have lots of room to grow in terms of learning about, about extrasolar planets. Um, and I, th to the second part of your question, um, how people can get involved, uh, you know, with, with SETI, certainly, I, I think checking out our, um, our website, seti.berkeley.edu, setiathome.berkeley.edu, there's lots of, of opportunities there uh, that, you can, that you can find. Uh, there's a website called SETIQuest, S-E-T-I-Q-U-E-S-T dot uh, org, uh, that's run by the, the SETI Institute in, in Mountain View that allows you to participate in some of their searches. And of course, uh, the Zooniverse, uh, Galaxy Zoo. If you if you Google any of those things, you'll find a, a lot of projects run by that group as well.